This may not seem like it to you, but it's a, it's a, it's a super significant night. And I know this is going to sound super weird. It's not about me. But full disclosure, this is essentially the first official night initiated kind of not at somebody else's church or somebody else's conference, but you're literally sitting in the very first night as a 37-year-old man pushing 40 for crying out loud that I am saying I'm actually initiating I'd like to help pastors. It's literally my first night ever doing something like this. I've done it for Pastor Brian. I've been to some of your churches, but for us to go, hey, this is Chelsea and I saying, I think we can help you. We'd like to help you. If nothing else, be encouraged by our glaring weaknesses and challenges and inconsistencies. You're going to th- feel a lot better about yourself, but that is this night. So it's like a big step. You could ask Chelsea, Elijah, and Anne Marie. I have fought against something like this for a long, long time because I always thought if you need help, go to Andy Stanley, go to Craig Rochelle, go to Rick Warren for obvious reasons. They're geniuses. Kind of what, what do we have to offer? had to put my big boy pants on and realize that I think we could help some pastors and some leaders. And so thank you for being a part of a night that is admittedly slightly awkward, challenging, and somewhat intimidating to say, hey, I think we can help you. But I do believe we can help you. We've been through some stuff and um, we're still here. I would highly recommend going to the beach with your spouse immediately. In fact, go back and tell your staff and tell your board that Judas said you have to immediately take a tropical vacation with your spouse. Any single people here, by the way, other than Trace? (laughs) Come on, Trace. Oh, whoa, whoa, like a little hot spot right here. Trace, four guys. Oh, man. (laughs) She hates me. (laughs) The lost art of empathy, you have to be empathetic. Is that how you say it? Yeah. I love it. Okay. Third John and verse two, brothers and sisters, I wish that you prosper and be in health, even as your, as your soul prospers. Ask yourself that question tonight, honestly, just internally, not to do it out loud. How is your soul? How is your soul? And what's your metrics and gauge for that? Uh, the vibes are good, you feel good, attendance is up, giving is strong, your brand is good. What, 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 what do you, where does your brain go to answer yes or no? How do you quantify or qualify that answer? Yes, I'm good because. No, I'm not good because. I found myself personally slightly kind of lost in an effort to decipher and discern whether or not my soul was good. For instance, and we write about this in the book, when it comes to diet, diet, right? This is a hilarious discussion. I grew up, if you're like me, on breakfast cereal because breakfast cereal was healthy. Do you remember that? And like healthy was what? It was Raisin Bran. Raisin Bran, right? Because it had a brand in the name, so you know that it's healthy, right? Or then there was a frosted mini wheats, and you knew it was healthy because there's wheat. Some of you like still think this is healthy. It's not. Newsflash, Nashville. (laughs) Okay. So, um, and then like Raisin Bran is caked in, those raisins are caked in preservatives, in sugar. Like they're not healthy for you at all. But that was the thought. It was like a little bit of milk, a little bit of raisin bran, right? Grape nuts. Anybody still eat grape nuts? Wow. They've lost their market. So, and it's amazing how, and then for, for instance, there was a while where bacon was the most evil, wicked thing. And I didn't eat bacon for like a decade because it's fattening and it's horrible, right? And remember the big fat craze, fat free, everything's gonna be fat free. Now, if you're like me, I am the exact opposite, right? Like I've done this like bulletproof diet where now good fats are where it's at. Have you, I'm sure you've heard this. I'm probably insulting your nutritional intelligence, but, but literally good fats is where it's, so you gotta have avocado, good fat, butter, cake it on, right? Bacon is much as you want, which is probably over the top, but that's how I think. So, and now it's, it's good fats. And recently someone told me, this literally happened, uh, someone was eating a banana and, and this particular person, Trace knows who it is, and he's like, excuse me, are you eating a banana? Are you eating a banana? And the person was like, yeah, he's like, you might as well have a can of Coke. He literally said this, and I'm like, what, what is happening to the world? What do you mean? He's like, the sugar process is from a banana in your body just like a can of Coke. I'm like, when, when bananas and Coca-Cola are synonymous, I'm out. I cannot handle this anymore. I can't process the ever-increasing knowledge 
of diet. How lost are we when it comes to diet? We had a discussion with friends in Pensacola the other day, and it was all around diets. And depending on which doctor you talk to, that doctor would tell you, no, can't, shouldn't, never, wow, right? I had a friend today in a publisher meeting, which will not be named, Brian Hampton, vice president of Thomas Nelson, who was drinking Diet Mountain Dew. That's poison, Nashville, okay? Dear Lord. But anyways, think about it. If we are this confused about our physical body and the diet it needs, how confused must we be when it comes to what our soul needs? Think about that. I mean, we, 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 we got so much effort in our culture and in our world and all these books and resources you can read to help facilitate a temporary shell. When we talk about the soul in the book, we talk about the inside you. You know, Psalms 103, which we'll talk a little bit about, it starts by saying, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. If you do any research on the soul, you will know that scholars, writers, thinkers, speakers, talkers, any Bible readers, there is so much discrepancy, so much dialogue, so much discussion and debate over how to define the soul. It seems in the narrative of scripture that spirit and soul and heart are kind of synonymous, kind of not, but mostly. And so I've done an effort to just keep it simple and clear. I think your soul is all that is within you. I think it's the inside you. But of course, our culture, you've heard it a million times, focuses so much on the outside you, which by the way, the Bible makes one little PS. It is of some profit, right? To kind of take care of your body. It's of some profit. God is for the body, the scripture says. But of course, we know that the majority of the narrative in relationship to the human being is centered on what? The inside you. How is the inside you? And of course, your job, ironically, as a church leader, a Bible teacher, a Jesus storyteller, is to actually minister to and aid and help the insides of others, which is why I can't put together a project like this and not stop, press pause before we go any further with the project and say, how are those who are tending to the souls of others? How is your soul? How is the inside you right now? In fact, I would challenge you to start asking each other. Those of you that are on team together, serving community together, I would challenge you to start using the term, hey, how's your soul? And make somebody give you an answer. It's so awkward. (laughs) Well, how's my soul? Well, I I think it's good. Why? Well, I feel good, good breakfast. It's sunny. I don't know, vibes. How is your soul good? Furthermore, it gets more complicated. How about when your soul's not good? No, I'm not good. Why? I just know I'm not good. I got some sin. I got some error. I got some, I, I, how do you fix that? How do you fix that? You ever gone on vacation, come home, and you know the classic cliche statement, you need a vacation from your vacation? You ever gotten physical rest, but come home emotionally drained? Honestly, that is an epidemic amongst church leaders. You get time in Maui, And everyone thinks you're coming home like you should just be invigorated, but for whatever reason, your soul didn't find reprieve and rest. And so you come home more frustrated, more agitated, more annoyed. It probably comes out in your preaching, let's be honest, because you can't seem to recapture your breath. You're out of breath. You don't have the margin you need. You don't have the space you need. How do you recover a healthy soul? How do you recover a healthy soul? What's it gonna take? We talk about in the book, I go back to the Garden of Eden and I call it the original environment for an optimal human soul. We talk about the four R's that are right there. By the way, the very first element or ingredient of an optimal environment, do you know what it was? Garden of Eden. And it says, and the trees were beautiful to look at and the fruit tasted really good. Do you know, that's the first characteristic we're told of the garden. That is it. Not the responsibility that Adam will have. Not, it's, it's, it's that, oh, like how amazing is God? He's like, I made these trees. How cool are those? You should taste the fruit. It's called natural sugar. Eat a banana for crying out loud. <laughs> right? Like, who is this God that we've taken so seriously, misunderstood him, that we have lost sight that one of the most essential elements for an optimal, healthy soul is rest, relaxation, and enjoyment. That you should enjoy art. 
You should enjoy the beautiful sights of trees and you should enjoy natural raw sugars as opposed to refined sugar. It's one of the first things said about the garden. It goes on to describe that Adam had a job. You need rest, you need responsibility. By the way, working is an honor and a privilege. It's not a part of the sin equation. It was always there, right? Responsibility, Adam was to serve. Serving, by the way, benefits the servant more than anyone. Serving is good for the soul. You, you, maybe you don't need to go to Maui. Maybe you need to do what you used to do before you were a big time pastor with bodyguards. Maybe you need to go back and just serve people and just remember what that was like going door to door. Maybe you need to go back to when you started your community and started the church and you used to just hang out late nights, laughing, talking about Jesus and sharing the highlighted passages of your Bible, right? Like serving people, what an honor and what a privilege we are benefiting the most. Of course, relationship is the most important thing. It talked about God would come and he would be with Adam. And then, of course, we know that the very first not good, I'm talking to preachers, the first not good in Bible is what? That Adam was by himself, so he made Eve and there was relationship. But one part of the garden we don't talk about a lot, and that is the one tree, the one tree, the one tree. God said, you can't touch that tree. Now, I've had a conundrum like I know you had. Lord, what, theologically, why would you do this? Why would you even put the tree there? And of course, there's a lot of stuff we could talk about that is beyond my level of intelligence. But I know this much, that without that tree, there is no choice. And the, we, 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 we fail to have a definition for love without choice, right? Without that tree, there is no choice of whether we obey God, love God, honor God, worship God, or choose our own way. So we need choice. But you know what else, what I think our soul needs? We, needs? we need restriction. I literally think God put that tree there for Adam because Adam needed a no in his life. You know what's crazy about being your own boss, some of your church leaders, is you actually had a healthier soul when you had someone telling you what to do. Honestly, it was so easy to have a healthy soul when, I, when my mom was in charge. Oh my gosh. I mean, my life was regimented. Are you kidding me? I mean, it was just like, I mean, and mom keeps a tight ship. But now all of a sudden, I'm in charge and I don't expect office hours except for I think the finance department and then everybody else is like, I don't know. I mean, if you're in your office all day, aren't we supposed to be out with people? So like, that's weird to me. I'm the most, like the worst nightmare for me as a pastor is walking through our church offices. I don't even know if we need church offices anymore, but walking through and seeing like all the pastors like at their desk, like clicking on their laptops, like we have lost the mission of Jesus. So like, I don't really, I don't really care about that, but I've noticed even in my own life, when all of a sudden I can call my own shots, am I implementing a necessary no? Just because you can doesn't mean you should. Have you told yourself no lately? And of course, these responsibility and restriction and, and rest and what's the other one that I, did I share all of them? And relationship, none of that works without righteousness. And we know that. All of this is pre-sin and of course, this is what we've got to get out to the world that you can have all the rest you can ever want. You can have all the cars and all the money and all the girls. But until you receive imputed righteousness from the Lord Jesus Christ, nothing will ever be truly okay on the inside of you. But he who knew no sin became sin so that we might become right with God permanently and eternally forever and ever without end. We're made righteous. A lot of our unsettled souls are as a result of our image of Jesus. The image of Jesus is that we are now in Christ. My life is hidden in Christ. When the Father sees me, he actually doesn't see me. He sees Jesus. And guess who he's always pleased with? Jesus. So be, as long as you stay hidden, as long as you stay in Christ, which is happens how? By simply accepting and receiving the gift. That's why Jesus said, unless you become like a little child, you'll never understand what I'm doing and building in my kingdom. I'm a king with a kingdom, but you got to accept it like a child. My, my, I used to ask my kids, will you forgive me? They would say, yep. Yep. Do you accept the forgiveness of Jesus like that? Lord, do you love me? Yep. It's just simple. God's smiling at you. He loves you and he approves of you. Now, from that place of righteousness, oh, I wish we could talk about righteousness for three hours, imputed righteousness, the gift that we simply receive from Jesus. This is our story, by the way. Now we can begin to look at those four elements 
of an essential soul. I want to I wanna land on one last thought in conclusion, and I want to read it to you in Genesis chapter 2. Check this out. Genesis chapter 2 and verse 7. Now, again, I'm talking to preachers, so bear with me. I'm sure you've read this and you've memorized it in Hebrew. But it says, Genesis 2, 7, Then the Lord God formed the man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, comma, comma, and the man became a living creature. Did you hear that? How do you define the soul? What is our soul? How do I know if I have a good soul, a bad soul, a healthy soul, a sick soul? How do, how, what, what, what is the soul? Well, wait a second. I think we just got an indication here. It says, so God formed Adam, and clearly, according to Genesis chapter 2 and verse 7, one of the most fundamental the- theology scriptures in all the Bible, man was a hollow, empty, lifeless shell. So we have literally the form of a man, but he is not a man and he is a not alive until what? God's breath. And then we are told he became alive. The most fundamental characteristic of the soul is the breath of God. It's the breath of God. Your breath that you are breathing literally is a gift from God. In actuality, fundamentally, theologically, philosophically, we actually are living on the borrowed breath of God. We literally share his, in his essence. We share his image. His breath is what makes us who we are. Apart from his breath, we cease to be human beings. We cease to be living creatures. We are lifeless and empty and shells. And of course, this is our story about redemption. This is our story about reconciliation with God and restoration and forgiveness is that people are the walking dead. They are literally living lifeless. They are like shells. And if you're like me and you walk the streets of your cities or your communities and you love these people and you know how much God loves them, you can literally see that they are walking around not recognizing and realizing that within them is the breath of God. And what they're actually searching for is to be reconnected and reunited with the one who gave them life in the first place. This is our message. But it is imperative for us to remember, and here is my one encouragement to you. If you're sitting here tonight and you're saying, my soul's not well, first of all, I know exactly how you feel. Like like someone said, do you feel like quitting? Yes, annually. My soul, I've been there more times than I can count. I'm not well, I just know. You know when you're nowhere all of a sudden. I'm not okay. My mind, my will, my emotions, however we define the soul, the inside me is not okay. And here's the scariest part about leadership. The longer you let this discrepancy grow in secret, the more difficult it will become and the more haunted you will be until eventually you'll do something so ridiculous so that you can alleviate the growing secret pain of the discrepancy and the inconsistency of who you are publicly and who you are privately and personally. So if there is any discrepancy, speak now. Say something now. Okay, I'm not well. Something's not okay. Talk to your team. Talk to those around you. Make new friends. Let us know if we can help you. But I'm going to give you the most honest answer in terms of what I do, and I do this on a regular basis, and how I find buoyancy. Is that okay to use that word? I find buoyancy. Do you know when your soul is buoyant? Do you know when, you're in, when your insides just feels like it's resilient? You feel, you feel alive when, you're, when, you're, when your soul is well. Here's how I'll... Here's how I'll explain kind of what I've learned to do. Psalms 103, which I mentioned a few minutes ago, and I'm coming to a close soon. I have no idea what time it is. My watch is on a different time zone, so someone stop me. Okay, is it, is it, is it 8 o'clock? 8, 10, 8, 8, 5, something like 10? Okay, come on. God's good. Um, Psalms 103. I'm sure you've read it. Um, one one scholar, one writer that I read said, Psalms 103 is the whole gospel in one song. It's the whole gospel. It starts personal. 
the psalmist writes, and then it goes to the public, and then it ends with the whole earth. Do, do you remember how Psalms 103 starts and ends? Do you remember? Psalms 103 starts with, bless the Lord, O my soul. Remember I quoted a moment ago, and all it is within me, bless his holy name. Do you know how Psalms 103 ends? Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. You know, there's 22 verses in Psalms 103. That's the same number of the Hebrew alphabet, which I find interesting. It's as if, it's as if the writer is giving us a hint, even in the ancient language, to say all of life, bookending all of life, is when your soul blesses the Lord. It's as if the psalmist is giving us a hint that the whole purpose for which you're actually literally created, it's not your cute little projects and programs and things and buildings we build. And we're so proud of them, aren't we? We're like, man, look at our new website. It's so cute. And like, I think God's in heaven going, oh, slugger, I'm so proud of you. You're so cute. You, know, you got 10,000 people in your church. You're changing the world, little buddy. You know, but we're so <laughs> proud of our accomplishments, aren't we? And maybe to an extent we should be, but but the truth is, that's not the essence of life. The essence of life isn't recognition, it's not opulence, it's not resources, it's not things, it's not stuff, it's, it's actually found in this ancient psalm. It's, you're most alive, you're most at your primary purpose when your soul is blessing the Lord. That word bless in the Hebrew means to gratefully and affect affectionately praise God. But you know what's crazy about the word soul there is that actually, if we look at breath as the, number, as the primary characteristic of the human soul and we look at Psalms 103, it's, it's all connected. The, the psalmist is saying, here's how your soul is well. Here's where your soul becomes alive is when you use your breath, the breath that is the primary characteristic quality of your soul. When you use that breath, do not underestimate the significance of you actually using your breath to gratefully and affectionately praise God. And I don't just mean when Hillsong is in town leading worship. Literally on your own, by yourself, when you start opening your mouth, don't underestimate what it does to your soul, what it does to the inside of you. The inside of you yearns to articulate and verbalize the beauty and the majesty and the glory of God. We talk about worship and how it blesses God, and it does, but I am telling you right now, when you affectionately, great Gratefully articulate, verbalize, use the breath that he's given you and you use it to affectionately honor and glorify God, something is ignited in your soul. The very reason for which you have breath is to use it to glorify God. I can prove how fundamental worship is to the entire earth experience. Do you know what Jesus actually said? If nobody gratefully or affectionately flaps their gums and their tongues to tell me that I'm great, these rocks will grow lips, gums, and tongues, and they will actually give me the praise that is due from creation. All of creation, all of the earth, is this, it is an altar of worship to the creator and the artist and the majesty and the glory that is our God. It exists. So literally when you, like this morning, we're driving from this little airport in Florida, making our way here, and Chelsea says, let's pray together, and all, something happens when I start talking to God. God, I love you, thank you so much, and all of a sudden, whoa. I, don't, I mean, we could talk left and right about prayer and making a difference and all. I, I, I just know this. When I opened up my mouth to start talking to God, do you remember when you were young? Do you remember before you became a professional preacher and you used to pray for hours and you used to talk to God, but then you got more mature and you realized that, you know, hours of prayer, it's all about Jesus. It's not about my prayers and he's a little more sovereign than I thought he was. And so what's the big deal? It's almost as if you need to have a returning again to that childlike faith where you just talk to God about everything and you just praised him. Remember when you used to write songs? Remember when you were kind of weird? Remember when you were like, you, you even said weird spiritual stuff to people and now you're like, you know, you're hipster and you're cool and you guys got a great brand and a great logo and it's awesome. But I wonder sometimes if we kind of need to be part of kind of who we used to be sometimes. Like we just, we, we, I grew up in services that lasted like three, four hours. Like I don't really totally want to go back to those days. But there's a part of me that's 
like, man, it was, it, I was on to something as a 20-year-old young man. God, I love you. You're amazing. Remember before you had pressures to sell books or post podcasts or travel to different campuses? Do, 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 do you remember when it was just simple? Man, for me, I remember being a custodian and just vacuuming the floors and cleaning the ladies' bathrooms. What a nightmare. And I remember listening to, po I remember, li I would say podcasts. I don't know if there were podcasts. Listening to Bishop Jakes, listening to my dad, listening to different leaders and preachers and dreaming and talking to God and crying. I remember getting down in the bathroom one time on my knees. I've never told this story before. And I'm like crying out for revival because I figured if I could cry and be emotional, I could bring God down to save the people. That's some really weird concepts, but nonetheless, I, I love Jesus. I love Jesus. Like I really love Jesus. I, I, I just think there's something that your soul wants to do. And you need to let your soul do it more. And that is to use that breath. You know how the whole psalm ends? Psalms 150. Do you know how the whole collection of the greatest songs ever written? Do you know how it ends? And let everything that has soul. Let everything that has breath. Breath and soul are synonymous in the Hebrew. In essence. Let everything that has soul praise the Lord. And it's in that place you find life, and you find health, and you find strength. It's amazing. And it's not complicated, and I promise I'm, I'm ending with this, but remember Mary and Martha? By the way, have you ever put two and two together? Do you know Mary and Martha, you know, Mary gets commended for doing nothing. Martha gets reprimanded for doing everything. Remember that? And do you know the passage right before? Do you know what it is? It's the Good Samaritan. This is in Luke's record. It's the Good Samaritan. Do you remember the Good Samaritan story? He does all these bandage wounds, pay the bill, you know, takes him to the Best Western, da, da, da. And, then, and then at the end, Jesus says, so go and do likewise. And the next passage, no wonder young people are confused reading the Bible. The next passage, Martha looks more like the Good Samaritan, not Mary. Martha's the one in the kitchen doing, go and do all this. There's Martha. Mary, she's doing nothing. She's a creative. She's an artist. She's a worship leader. She's doing nothing. I love worship departments. What do you guys do all day? You know what I mean? It's like, dude, check out this new Tomlin. But, um, <laughs> oh man. Um, remember, so, so, so Mary's there, the hopeless creative, like Martha probably pays all the bills. She's the older sister, classic stereo, like birth order issues, right? Martha's a doer. She's a provider. She's preparing. Hello, Messiah. Jesus is in our home. Listen, home, in our, in our home, in our home. I felt like God asked me long before this book ever became a project. He said, when is the last time your soul went home? You ever been on a long trip? How cathartic is home when you, get, when you get back? I mean, it's your musk in the air, right? Like it's your toilet. No toilet seats needed. It's your home, right? There's nothing about, it. I mean, it's proven psychologically. I'm no doctor, but like it, having your own space does something for you emotionally, mentally, even physically improving your health when you're finally home. When's the last time? God asked me, when's the last time your soul was home? I don't think it's an accident that Jesus bottom lines the human existence in a living room of a home. Now I would, Jesus literally bottom lines our whole purpose for existence with two young ladies. Now if I'm Jesus, if you're gonna bottom line the human existence, I say get more bang for your buck and do it like on the mountain when you're doing like the Beatitudes or something. Like, but right in a home, in a living room, he turns to Martha, you know the story, and he says, no, Martha, I'm not going to rebuke Mary. Because she is doing, listen to, she is doing the, the one thing that is necessary in all of life. Wait, God, are you bottom lining the human existence right now in an evening in Martha and Mary's living room? Yeah. So if you're like me, this one thing is necessary and Mary is like, and Mary has accepted that. She's doing it. Are you like me? Do you stop and try to look at the scene and go, what is Mary doing? Like she's not really doing anything. 
right? I mean, in terms of, oh, look, we're from America. We are doers, okay? Like, wh- what is she doing? As a leader, can I just be honest with you? Which do you look more like right now? Martha or Mary? It gets back to our discussion of success. You're not going to get anything done sitting there like Mary. You got to get out there and get it done. Man, I want to be more like Mary. Can I just say that? I don't know if that's the most popular thing in our culture. Mary sat there. What did she do? Well, she didn't do much of anything, did she? I'll tell you what she do. What she, what she do. <laughs> I'll tell you what she do. Okay. But <laughs> I'll tell you what she did. She listened to Jesus, didn't she? Come on. You know what it was like. She's a creative. She sat there just, wow. What did Jesus talk about? I don't know. Love, grace. We're not even privy to their private, personal conversation. Mary is just enraptured with her Messiah and Jesus. He says to Martha, that is the one thing that's necessary in life. Really, God? But I'm doing all this for you. We're building these churches. We're building these ministries. We're doing, God, we're doing great things. Have you seen, Lord, we're starting, we're starting a clothing line at our church, God. Aren't you impressed? God, we got a new espresso machine in our lobby. Lord, we're so busy. It's only one thing that's necessary. What is that? To be with me. Just to be with me, to listen, to affectionately, gratefully praise. And that's when you're alive. All right, Judah, I get it, I get it, I get it. So it's one of, we're doing one of these things again, where you tell us pastors that we need to go back to the future. We need to go have a renaissance, go back to relationship with God. All right, I, I get it, I get it. We, 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 we gotta get in our Bible time. We gotta get in our devotions. Gotta pray a little bit, I get it. Yep, all right, I'm landing the plane, I got it. I'm gonna re-up my devotions. It's gonna be great, I'm gonna do my devotions. I think in an effort, to help people connect with God, we have overpackaged being with Jesus. Am I okay to say that? Like, I do devotionals. We'll sell you devotionals if you'd like to buy. A one time, $9.99. But it's a joke, relax. <laughs> but I wonder if we've complicated it. Is that okay to say? Like, Chelsea and I, we had to plan this trip. I'll give you that. But when we got to this beach, for two and a half, three days, we were, just, we were just with each other. And it was part of the beauty is the spontaneity. What are we gonna do? We're gonna ride bikes, we're gonna ride around, and, and we're just gonna, I don't know, you wanna stop here, you wanna go to this cafe, you wanna get a salad here, not a diet Mountain Dew? Like, what do you, like, do we do that anymore with God? Like, have you ever, can I tell you a story? And I'm almost done, I promise. I remember sitting in a room as a youth pastor, speaking to my 20-year-old self. My gosh, I was very militant at times. It was embarrassing. And I remember going around the room, and I'm like, I'm going to every guy. I'm like, how you doing? It wasn't how your soul. I was like, how you doing? How's your prayer time? How's your Bible time, right? And all the guys were like, good. I'm like, how long you praying? Each guy was like, 30 minutes, 40, you know. And I get to one of the new guys that had recently gotten saved. and says, how you doing? He's like, uh, pretty good, I think. You know, you can tell. He's like, what are we doing? And I'm like, how's your prayer life? And he's like, uh, yeah, good. And I'm like, how long are you praying? And he literally said this. He goes, I didn't know we were timing our prayers. I, I'm not entirely sure how long I pray. And I was like, who's the idiot? I am. And I say, hey, if God says I want you to pray 30 minutes every day, I hope you pray 31 minutes every day, and I hope you time it. That's between you and the Lord. But if we're not careful... We're going to make it about devotions. I don't want to do devotions. I want to be with Jesus. In fact, I don't want to limit it just to morning devotions. I want to talk to him. I want to listen to him. I want to be with him. I never got into any of this to be a professional. I just love Jesus. I remember in high school just telling my basketball buddies about Jesus because I just love Jesus. Do you remember those days like before you knew like you, 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 had to have Instagram followers and you had to have a brand and you had to have like a hipster church with a coffee house connected. Do do you remember when you met Jesus? Do you remember when you just told people about him? Do you remember when you just invited people to Jesus? Not because your youth pastor preached a series on inviting friends to Jesus. I remember those days. It's like, I just, 
Love Jesus. Now, this is really embarrassing to admit. But as a leader, have you ever secretly, privately asked yourself, do I literally love Jesus all by myself? Or do I love what following Jesus has given me? Or do I just love Jesus? Do I just want to follow him no matter what? I want to challenge you. I want to challenge you. I'm, I guess I'm just begging. I'm shamelessly begging you as leaders that you would rediscover. And you know, if you're here and you say, Judah, this might be news to you, to be honest, man. I, I, I've never been in a better place with the Lord. Can I just say thank you? And we're going to close this session, and then you're going to have a session, okay? But for some of us in this room, that's just not the case anymore. Things have gotten complex and layered and challenging. Can I encourage you to develop, to develop an authentic friendship with Jesus? One thing is necessary. One thing is necessary. One thing is necessary. Not church attendance, not tithing and offerings. One thing is necessary. What's the one thing Mary's doing? She's sitting there engrossed and enamored with Jesus. With Jesus. I promise I'm ending. This is my last story. And I'm a couple minutes early. Tracy's here. Tracy's dad and mom pastored a church for 30 years in Boise, Idaho, and now her cousin, one of my best friends in the whole world, and one of the smartest Christian minds in the whole world, her brother is now pastoring the church along with his wife. I, uh, I was nine, 11 years old in Boise, Idaho, and my dad was speaking a seminar that he called the, the Dragon Slayer Seminar. And um, <clears throat> we traveled as a family for about five years, if you can tell, it was the 80s, the Dragon Slayer Seminar. By the way, the logo is super cool now. In fact, I'm going to start wearing the t-shirts again. It's awesome. Anyways, um, he was preaching about vision and destiny and purpose. And I'm sitting there, and I'm probably doodling, just listening to my dad. I love my dad. And all of a sudden, I heard the closest thing to the audible voice of God to this day I've ever heard. And I heard this. You will be a preacher to your generation. That's what I heard. And, I, and it's hard for me to explain what I experienced that night. And I walked out of the room and we were all going to, I don't know, our favorite place somewhere in downtown Boise, Idaho. It's a big town, beautiful. <laughs> Tracy hates when I take shots at Boise, but um, great potatoes. And <laughs> massive. And I'm walking out. And thank God for it. I know not everybody had this, but thank God for my dad. He loved Jesus. He was sensitive to the Lord. We're walking out and He's walking out with Uncle Kenny, his best friend. And I said, oh, hey, Dad. And he kind of turned around. He's like, son, you good? I'm like, yeah, see you at the restaurant. And he's just about to walk out the door. Thank God he didn't. He turned back. He goes, son, what is it? And I never forget looking at my dad. I'm thinking, and immediately, you know, I'm, I'm an emotional basket case. I've been this way for 37 years. And I started crying. And before I could even say it, he started crying. And I said, Dad, Jesus called me. He called me. And I remember a weird feeling, you know, at, at 11 years old thinking, um, I'm so honored to serve Jesus, you know? And I remember looking at my dad and we're crying and we're praying. And I remember having the craziest feeling that it was the coolest thing in the world that I could serve him. And I didn't know enough to know that, you know, I would do book deals and I would meet with celebrities. I didn't know. I just, I loved my dad, wanted to be like my dad. I met at 11 years old. I wasn't a perfect kid, but I loved Jesus. I loved Jesus. I'd close my eyes and I remember back then we'd have camp and camp would go till midnight. I didn't know any better. Now I'm too tired to do that. I don't want to raise my hands that long, you know. <laughs> I'm so modern. But do you remember, like for me as a kid, I, I'd camp all night, man. And we'd worship for an hour and then the preacher would preach forever. And then we'd worship for another hour. And as a kid, just, I just loved Jesus. When did, when did we lose some of that, you know? When did we lose some of that? And again, I, I'm not trying to put my challenges on you. 
And then again, maybe some of you are like, dear God, Judah, when this is done, we're all going to hug you because <laughs> we're not sure your soul. I'll take it, okay? But I just, I want to love Jesus. And you know what our world needs? Not more professionals, man. And by the way, there's people who do better smoke machines, who do better clothes, who do better speaking and singing than we. But you know what we get to do as leaders and pastors? We get to tell the story of Jesus and that God actually gave us, it may not be a great gift, but he gave us somewhat of a gift, enough to captivate a few people when we tell them the story of our God. And that is a high honor. When did we lose sight of that? What a privilege. Jesus is so crazy about you. He loves you so much. And so there's a part of me, I'm so the optimist, right? Like I, everything's awesome. And I always say that I love people. I have friends who are like, you know, I only say that I love you to people that I mean it to. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I can't fathom life like that. I don't know why, but I don't think I have any makeup on, but I feel like mascara is getting in my eye, but um, <clears throat> I know the feeling, if you're wondering, but um, <laughs> just to be honest. So yeah, I mean, I'm the guy that a night like this, I'm like, I hope everything changes for pastors. And it may not. It may not. That might be overplaying our hand a little bit, but I don't know. I guess I'm hoping if nothing else, you're kind of, if I could say it, like you're haunted by a night like this. Have you lost the joy of your salvation? Have you lost the simplicity of loving Jesus? Have you lost that 11-year-old wonder of, I get to follow Jesus? Wow. God, you're amazing, and I love you so much. Do you remember highlighting your Bible a ton? Do you remember just reading the Bible not for a sermon or a curriculum, but just reading it and losing track of how long you had been reading it? Do you remember that? Do you meet with people sometimes and they'd say like, pastor, would you pray for me? Like, I only read my Bible through one time this year and I really believed I was going to read it through twice. And you're like, well, that's a lot more than your pastor. <laughs> sure, I'll pray for you. And I feel horrible, you know, like, <laughs> have you had some of those moments? Man, let's recover. Let's recover the joy of our salvation. Let's recover that childlike faith. This, yeah, I want you to get your hands on it. Yeah, I believe in it. This is not exhaustive at all, but this is me trying to bleed on paper and saying, we can't have any more casualties. So I am, I'm begging you to do whatever it takes. We need you. I love you. Again, there I go saying, I love you. I know maybe we never met, but I love you and I believe in you. And I guess if God has given us, you know, ah, I got to think of like someone's cat dying or something. So I stop crying, but, but actually that's thrilling to me, but, um, <laughs> less cats, better world. But, um, I, uh, Yeah, you know, we, we just love you. And, and my family's here, my friends are here. If we can serve you, it's embarrassing to say that I think we can, I think we can help you because I never want to be that guy in the room, you know? But um, it's humbling. Huh? Um, we're, we're, we need the message of Jesus so bad right now, you know? And... Um, I'm just losing it, but uh, we need you to tell the story of God. But if you're not well, what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his soul, you know? So I'm asking you, if you've got to stop, if you've got to get time off, you've got to do whatever it takes, can we help you? We love you. I saw this night being so much more fluid and concise and profound, but it is what it is. And this is not another book for me. It's not another project. Um, it's a passion of mine to serve pastors and to help you in any way that we can.